it's kind of hard to discuss the election in depth. So we're going to talk about the making of the modern presidency, um, how presidents over time have shaped their office um, to create what we see as the modern presidency. And just a reminder, the research paper is due Tuesday night by 11.59 p.m. So just make sure you give it in to me on Tuesday or before Tuesday, whatever. Okay. So the first president we can kind of see as creating the modern presidency is Franklin Roosevelt or FDR. He is the only president to serve more than two terms. He was elected to four terms in office. He's the reason why we have a constitutional amendment limiting presidents to two terms. Because prior to that, it was tradition, but it wasn't a rule. This is why he could run for four consecutive terms. He was also president during two of the worst crises in American history, the Great Depression, and World War II. So obviously, part of the reason he was elected to four terms is people didn't want to change leadership in a time of crisis. He was pulling the American people out of the Great Depression, and then we got involved in another global war. It's because of FDR that our federal government has increased in size. He was the first president to say, is the responsibility of the federal government to fix the economy, to try to keep unemployment low, to provide social benefits. He's responsible for the creation of social security, consumer protections and bank accounts, the FDIC, unemployment benefits. All those are, are the direct result of the Roosevelt administration. He did have trouble getting some of what he wanted done by Congress, so he basically, or not by Congress, by the Supreme Court. At one point, he said, look, if you're not going to do what I want you to, I'll add five or six more justices to the Supreme Court. Um, the Supreme Court took that threat seriously and was like, okay, we'll stop shooting down your proposals. Of course, he's also responsible for one of the greatest civil liberties violations in modern history, the illegal internment of Japanese Americans, um, which goes without saying that that was one of the worst things that could be done, one of the worst Supreme Court decisions upholding this internment. But despite this, historians do consider him one of our greatest presidents for his steady leadership, his getting us out of the Great Depression, and his leadership during World War II. Um, so by and large, he is considered one of the best presidents of history. He's also the only president we've ever had who needed to use a wheelchair. Um, he was partially paralyzed due to polio. And he was very careful to make sure that he wouldn't be photographed in a wheelchair because he didn't want the American people to see him as disabled. So it's rare to find a photo of him sitting in a wheelchair other than when he's with his family. Otherwise, he would be standing or he'd be seated in a chair. Um, people knew he was partially paralyzed. They didn't really talk about it. It wasn't something that was considered critical for the American people to know. FDR died from a prolonged illness in May of 1945. Not long after taking the oath for his fourth term in office, he passed away due to illness. So Harry Truman becomes president during a world war. And he gets the shock of his lifetime when he walks in and they say, Mr. President, we've been developing a nuclear weapon. Now we need to fill you in on this. Um, so he had to hit the ground running for that. Um, Roosevelt never told him about it because he didn't see it as important. 
So we had to learn about the program, how the weapons worked, and decide if we should drop nuclear weapons on Japan. It wasn't an easy decision by any stretch of the imagination. For him, he had to look at that and say, obviously it's going to cause a huge amount of death. We decided it was worth it to end the war more quickly rather than drag it on for another year or two years. So for better or worse, the decision was made. Um, and of course, the after effects, um, I don't think anyone could have predicted how bad it was going to be. Um, but he had to make the decision and he had to make it quickly. He's also responsible for creating the first um, economic rebuilding plan on a global scale. Europe was pretty much destroyed by World War II. Um, London was in ruins, Paris, Rome, Berlin. So Truman set up loans from the U.S. government to help these countries rebuild. It was because of the Marshall Plan that Europe was able to rebuild um, as quickly as it did. Within a decade, most of the countries had been rebuilt. Most of the cities had recovered from the war. Now, they did this partly because of the fear of communism. But it was really the first time that we acknowledged that we have a responsibility to help other countries after a crisis. It opened the door for us to be giving more emergency aid, loans, and so on. It's because of Truman that we have the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank. It's also instrumental in helping to get the Charter for the United Nations signed in San Francisco at the end of the war. He was a proponent of civil rights. Um, he knew he couldn't get Congress to decide to desegregate the armed forces, but did it through executive order. If we had soldiers coming back from World War II and saying, I fought for freedom on the other side of the world, but I can't stay in this hotel. I can't be integrated with white soldiers. It just didn't make any sense. We decided that we might as well go ahead and desegregate the military. He has the unfortunate distinction of being a president during two wars. Um, he got us out of World War II. In 1950, he got us involved in the fight between North and South Korea. Um, this eventually would end in a stalemate. We still have today where you've got North Korea, South Korea, and then that um, militarized zone where there's land mines and weapons and nobody can cross between. So again, he did try to promote civil rights but he couldn't get anywhere with Congress. The best he was able to do was integrate the armed forces, and that wasn't nothing. I mean, that was pretty significant at the time. The argument had been integration would cause problems with the soldiers, um, and it was too radical. For the most part, the soldiers said, I don't really care the color of the person next to me. I just don't think they have my back. So, basically proved that it didn't matter if you integrated the military. It wasn't going to be the end of the world. For a man who got quite the shock at the beginning of his presidency, he did manage to kind of um, learn pretty quickly and, and do what needed to be done. So he served two terms in office um, before Eisenhower became president in the 1950s. He had no political experience prior to becoming a president. He had never run for political office. However, he was a career military man. He had spent a fair amount of time in the military and became a five-star general during World War II. His military strategy and skills made him very popular with Americans. So he was encouraged to run by the Republican Party because of his popularity with the American people. Because he was seen as 
of the brains behind the military might during World War II. But even though he didn't have experience in office, he did know how politics worked. He didn't know how to go to Congress to ask for more money, for more troops, for decision making by the people higher up. So he wasn't a complete neophyte. He had some idea how politics worked. He is responsible for the creation of the federal interstate system. Prior to this, there was no clear set of roads that came from California to New York. It would take all these secondary roads that maybe weren't in great shape. To facilitate the easy transportation of goods, services, and troops as needed, Eisenhower signed the federal interstate system into law creating a series of roads that we have today, Interstate 2 and so on, that go all the way across the United States. Make it easier for people to get from point A to point B, where theoretically you could go from Texas to California in a day, rather than taking the better part of a week. Of course, you need a lot of Red Bull to do that, but hypothetically you could. Um, so that was one of the big, big things that he did. He also chose to use the military to enforce Brown versus the Board of Education. He said the Supreme Court has decided this. If you're not going to cooperate, I'll declare martial law and I'll make you cooperate. So he put Little Rock under martial law and made it clear to the states in the South that the government would not tolerate opposition to the Supreme Court. Because of his sending of federal troops, um, most states in the South chose to comply with Brown rather than try to fight it. Internationally, it was a bit of a mixed bag. Um, respected internationally, but made some decisions that would later come back to haunt us. While he was president, um, Iran got its first democratically elected prime minister named Mossadegh. Most of the oil in Iran was controlled by large companies like Shell, BP, and others. Mossadegh wanted to nationalize the oil industry, um, which was seen as communism. So the U.S. joined um, with the CIA to overthrow their first democratically elected leader and replace him with the Shah of Iran. Again, was a decision that would come back and bite us in the 1970s. Um, he was also partially responsible for the overthrowing of the first democratically elected leader of what is now the Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, that leader, Patrice Lumumba, um, was kidnapped, beaten, shot, and his body was dropped into a barrel of acid to prevent anyone from ever finding his remains. Um, and that is on record, by the way. The CIA has declassified the documents that showed we helped the Belgians to overthrow this leader. So he made some policy decisions that weren't exactly a, a great idea, um, and that would later come back to us. And before he left office, he did give a warning about the military industrial complex saying, we need to be careful about giving the military too much power. He didn't want huge defense budgets. He didn't want high military spending. So he warned against it. Um, he likely would not approve of how much money we actually spend on defense today. Um, because he didn't like the idea of the military getting too powerful. Okay, so Eisenhower serves two terms, and in the election of 1960, it was John Kennedy versus Vice President Richard Nixon. Kennedy was groundbreaking for two reasons. Um, he was the first Catholic president and the only one we've had so far, and the youngest elected president at the age of 43. The youngest ever president was Theodore Roosevelt, he was 42 when McKinley was assassinated. Kennedy is the youngest elected at 43. It was pretty controversial that he was Catholic. He had to 
explain to voters that you will not take orders from the Pope. It was not beholden to the Vatican. Um, so it wasn't without its controversies at the time. And he comes into office and he gets involved in the absolute disaster known as the Bay of Pigs. He started under the Eisenhower administration. The idea was that we would arm and train Cuban dissidents to overthrow Fidel Castro. We took a bunch of dissidents, dropped them in Cuba, and left them to fight the Cuban military. You can imagine how well that went. Um, the dissidents got their butts handed to them, uh, and the U.S. was embarrassed. Um, this clearly backfired, and it just gave Fidel Castro even more power in Cuba. Um, and not a very smart decision. Yeah. Then in 1962, he came very, very, very close to going to war with the Soviet Union over Cuba. Cuba is 90 miles from Florida. And in the 1960s, the United States had put missiles in Turkey on the border with the Soviet Union. They retaliated by putting missiles in Cuba. We said to the Russians, get pure missiles out of Cuba, and they said, go to hell. So we were going back and forth, and we were on the brink of war. And in 13 days, President Kennedy successfully negotiated an agreement with the Soviet Union that we would pull our missiles out of Turkey, they would pull their missiles out of Cuba, and both sides got what they wanted. Um, so he got a lot of credit for his calm, rational handling of the crisis rather than letting it escalate to a global war. He was also responsible for the creation of the Peace Corps, um, which got its start in Latin America, but of course is now global. Um, the idea that Americans are two years abroad helping with things like agriculture, education, nursing, and so on. He also increased U.S. military involvement in South Vietnam and um, was responsible in a way for the assassination of the Prime Minister of South Vietnam um, after the South Vietnamese Prime Minister embarrassed the U.S. by mistreating tourists. He was a bit lukewarm on the issue of civil rights. Um, he tended to think that that was the state's issue. He didn't want to tick off Democrats in the South. So his attitude was essentially, it's important, but let's we'll see how this plays out. He wasn't willing to push for civil rights. And of course, he was assassinated in Dallas on November 22nd, 1963. And I don't know how many conspiracy theories there are about that. The official report says it was one shooter, the Harvey Oswald, but take your poison, there's about 10 different conspiracy theories. One that uh, Johnson ordered the assassination, which makes no sense to me, um, that there was a second shooter, that it was the CIA. You look at it 16 different ways and get 16 different answers. Um, no one's fully satisfied with the formal answer for how he died. But um, according to the U.S. government, it's lone gunmen who killed President Kennedy. Uh, before they could put Oswald on trial, he was shot and killed in a Dallas police station. So if you look into the history of that, it's really tumultuous and it's kind of scary time for the American people. People tend to look at the Kennedy administration for what they thought it would be rather than what it was. They tend to look at the rose picture of what would he have done versus what he actually did. Um, he did some good things, but he wasn't the perfect president. So we got to remember that when we talk about Kennedy. He was also responsible for the creation of the space program. Um, and the promise that we would get a man on the moon by the end of the decade. Okay, so Kennedy gets assassinated and Lyndon Johnson becomes president. Johnson 
was more active on the issue of civil rights. He was able to get Congress to pass the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Wilson was about six four. He was a big guy. And so he would do what he called the Johnson lean. He would get right up close to someone and he would lean in right into their face with that height of his and intimidate the living hell out of them. And it worked. That's how he got the senators to do what he wanted them to do. He would really get up in people's faces. Um, he was known as a bit of a bully, uh, intimidating. But it worked. He was able to get things done. Um, he also wasn't happy with the state of health care and poverty in the United States. So he created the Great Society program. Medicare and Medicaid, increase um, spending on unemployment, um, education spending, basically trying to fix the huge pockets of poverty that still exist within the United States. Um, he wanted to make sure children went to school, people had access to health care, um, adequate housing, and so on. Unfortunately, funding for these programs fell by the wayside when he started spending more money and more time in Vietnam. Uh, so he, Johnson, was responsible for the U.S. actually going to war in Vietnam. And the longer it dragged on, the less happy the American people were with him. Anti-war protesters would take to the street and chant, hey, hey, LBJ, how many kids did you kill today? Um, not a very popular guy towards the end of his presidency. Um, and so he saw the writing on the wall. Even though he could have run for president in 68, um, because he wasn't, um, you know, he really served one term as president, you know, elected in 64, he chose not to run for re election. Um, and he waited until the beginning of 1968 to announce that he wasn't going to run. Um, I looked around him and he just said, I'm not going to be able to win. I can't do this anymore. And he chose to step up. He was well regarded for his calm leadership after Kennedy was assassinated. His work on civil rights, meeting with leaders like John Lewis, um, Martin Luther King Jr., and others um, to promote civil rights across the U.S. 1968 was a very turbulent year for a variety of reasons. Um, the Vietnam War wasn't going well. Dr. King was assassinated in April, and then Bobby Kennedy was shot and killed on the night of the California primary. So it wasn't a very good time in American history. There was a lot of violence, um, protests, people bombing buildings. Uh, it's not that surprising that Johnson said he had enough and wanted to leave. Richard Nixon, aka Tricky Dick. Um, kind of a funny story because when he lost the 1960 election, he went to the press and he said, You won't have Tricky Dick to kick around anymore. Um, basically, trying to say he wasn't going to run again. Um, he was tired of politics. He didn't like what happened in 1960. But then he decided to run again in 1968. It's funny because had Bobby Kennedy lived, it essentially would have been a rematch of 1960. Instead of John Kennedy, it would have been Bobby Kennedy versus Richard Nixon. It would have been Kennedy, Nixon, or two. Um, so Nixon ran as the law and order candidate, the establishment candidate. After the disastrous Democratic National Convention, the voters looked at how calm and organized and peaceful the Republican confession was. And he was elected partly because people were tired of the violence and the chaos. Um, and they saw him as someone who could 
restores the world order. So he did find a way to end the Vietnam War. Um, unfortunately, what ended up happening was we signed a peace agreement, we pulled out of South Vietnam, and then North Vietnam overran South Vietnam, and the country became communist anyway. So we spent the better part of a decade fighting a war to prevent communism, and the end result was exactly the same. So that didn't go over to the communist people. He was also responsible for normalizing relations with communist China, uh, the formal recognition of the Chinese government, and the establishment of a trade relationship, which of course has had its uh, benefits and drawbacks, right? But that started during the Nixon administration, the willingness to engage in economic relations with mainland China. Nixon was also responsible for the creation of the Environmental Protection Agency. It was something that tends to get um, overlooked when we talk about Nixon. He had horrifically bad pollution in the United States. The main river in Cleveland would occasionally catch fire because of all the industrial pollution. Um, you couldn't see the World Trade Center in New York through the pollution haze some of the time. It was really bad. It was because of Nixon that we have the Clean Air and the Clean Water Act, that you can't dump toxic waste into the water um, without getting some kind of penalty for it. Um, obviously, we don't want the rivers spontaneously catching on fire. Despite some of the good that Nixon did, um, he was, in my opinion, one of the most corrupt presidents in history. Um, for some reason, he very stupidly authorized a break-in of the Democratic National Committee headquarters in 1972 to try and bug their headquarters to get inside information on their campaign strategy. Luckily, the burglars were caught before they could get in and do that. But over time, it became clear that someone in the administration had authorized this illegal break-in. Then they found out he was secretly tape recording discussions in the White House. Now, the tape deck had actually been put into place by Johnson to record important meetings for the secretaries. Nixon was using it to talk about his enemies. You got to take this son of a bitch out, things like that. Um, illegal activities. When Congress realized his illegal activity was actually on tape, they subpoenaed him. He was ordered to turn over the tapes. And rather than get impeached and convicted, he chose to resign. Um, the odds are very, very good that he would have been the only president in history to be impeached and convicted by the Senate. Um, so rather than get kicked out of office, he chose to leave. Um, so he stepped down and left. And it's the Watergate scandal that partly led to the American people not trusting their government anymore. Not believing that the government is corrupt. But they lied to us. Um, so we can trace back some of the lack of trust in the government to Nixon and the Watergate scandal. Nixon steps down and Gerald Ford becomes president. We're not going to talk about Ford. Um, he wasn't in office for very long. He's really only remembered for a couple of things. One, his controversial pardoning of Nixon after he left office so he wouldn't face criminal charges. And two, when he was in a presidential debate, his repeated and mistaken insistence that Poland was not under control by the Soviet Union, which made him look uneducated to the American people and cost him the election. Um, so we're just going to skip him because there's just not that much to talk about with him. Okay, so Ford is president for about two years, and then we get Jimmy Carter. Carter was seen as an honest, reliable candidate and an outsider. He started off as a peanut farmer before becoming governor of Georgia. Um, he'd served in the military in World War II. He was faithful to his wife. He was seen as a good, 
Christian man. So people looked at that and they're like, we're tired of politics as usual, we're tired of these insiders. Let's give this guy a chance. So he won. Unfortunately, um, he didn't have a lot of love as president. He became president during one of the worst energy crises in history. The price of oil skyrocketed um, to the point where there was rationing and people could only buy gasoline certain days a week. He did put solar panels on the roof of the White House and tried to encourage us to invest in solar and wind energy, saying oil's not reliable, we gotta switch. Um, but he couldn't get Congress to agree to that. We could have had solar or wind energy in the 1970s, and we didn't. So that's unfortunate. On the plus side, um, the world was responsible for 1978 for creating peace between Israel and Egypt. Um, prior to the Camp David Accords, Egypt refused to recognize Israel as a legitimate country in the Middle East. They'd gone to war with each other a couple of times. So Carter got Egypt to recognize Israel as a legitimate country, and the two sides agreed to peace. So this was groundbreaking, um, and the two leaders of Israel and Egypt shared the Nobel Peace Prize. Um, and Carter has done a lot of work on human rights, um, promoting human rights in South America, Africa, and so on. He also deregulated the airline industry. Um, the government no longer controlled the airfares, the routes, and new airlines. But this is both good and bad. It allowed for more competition. Unfortunately, it's why airlines can now charge us for baggage and seats and whatever else the hell they want because they're not controlled by the government anymore. Carter, unfortunately, was president when Eisenhower's actions came back to bite us in the butt. So after we overthrew Mossadegh and put the Shah of Iran into place, he was infamous for being corrupt, um, spending millions of dollars, and torturing his opponents. In 1979, the Shah of Iran was overthrown in a revolution by the Islamic fundamentalists led by the Ayatollah Khomeini. And because of our continued support for the Shah of Iran, the Islamic um, troops in Iran took over our embassy and held 52 of our citizens and diplomats hostage for 444 days. Carter kept trying to negotiate their release and he couldn't get there. So remember, everything has a consequence, right? What goes around comes around. So our actions in the 1950s came back to bite us in the 1970s. Um, so because Carter was dealing with the energy crisis, the recession, and the Iran hostage crisis, he didn't stand a chance of winning in 1980. Um, he basically was dead in the water. And it's funny because he's actually a much better former president than he was a president. Which sounds weird, but it's true. Um, he created the Jimmy Carter Center that oversees peace agreements, elections, um, treatment of prisoners. He won a Nobel Peace Prize in the 1990s for his work abroad. He's in his late 90s and he still teaches Sunday school, still goes out and does Habitat for Humanity with his wife. And apparently when he gets on a plane, he walks down the aisle shaking hands with everyone and saying, hi, I'm Jimmy Carter. Goes down to earth, really good guy. Not a great president. Really good guy. Um, yeah, he's still out there, but he's like 98 years old and he still goes out and does Habitat for Humanity. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, he's he's actually one of the really good guys. He's, he's someone that I admire personally, but yeah, not a great president. Not a great president. Um, but yeah, he, he fell in like the... He's broken multiple bones and he's still out there doing Habitat for Humanity. Like, he's just, yeah, he's, he's tough. He's a tough guy. 
Okay, so then we get Reagan. Um, Reagan had been an actor before becoming governor of California. And he was our first truly economic and social conservative Republican president. Um, he's partly the reason why the Republican Party has been moving to the right. Um, it was really during the start of his presidency we saw liberal Republicans leaving the party. And he was supported by evangelicals because of his opposition to affirmative action, abortion, and his support for prayer in schools. Um, 1981, he was responsible for the break of one of the biggest unions in the United States. The air traffic controllers were under a lot of pressure. They were working 17, 18 hour days, um, nights, weekends. There were a couple of close calls where two planes almost collided because the air traffic controllers were so good they couldn't keep track of the flight. The air traffic controllers went on strike and they're like, look, we need better working conditions. Previous presidents would have negotiated. Reagan said, get back to work or you're fired. Hired a whole bunch of striking workers and brought in replacements. Basically, he said the unions aren't in charge anymore, and if you're not going to cooperate, you're gone. He's also responsible for what's known as trickle down economics or Reaganomics. Um, this is a belief that if you cut taxes for the wealthy, you'll spend the money and the money will filter down through society. It was very, very popular in the 1980s. Can anyone tell me what's wrong with this theory? Yes, also the way it cut their taxes, they invest it. They don't spend it because they don't have to. If you're a millionaire, why would you need to spend the money for a tax cut? It's a great theory, it just doesn't work in practice. So what happened was the gap between the rich and the poor actually grew exponentially in the 1980s. So if you want to emulate the economy, you don't cut taxes on the wealthy, you cut them on the middle and lower classes. Because if everybody in this room got a thousand dollar tax rebate, you're not probably going to spend the money on something you need or want, right? You'd be like, I'm going to buy a new computer or my car or whatever, right? You would go out and spend a month wealthy don't. It's a great theory on paper, it just doesn't work in, in practice. Um, and it's gone and come around a couple of times, but the idea was trying to stimulate the economy, it just didn't quite work. To increase the war on drugs, this is where we started to see mandatory minimums coming into play. Um, he also got a lot of criticism over his response to the AIDS crisis. The administration was slow to respond. Um, keep in mind, originally, when AIDS reached the United States, it first affected homosexual men. The attitude of some of the people in the Reagan administration was, well, this is God's punishment for homosexuality, and if it's only affecting them, well, well. Um, it took the government a while to realize that AIDS wasn't just a problem in the homosexual community that it impacted hemophiliacs who got tainted blood transfusions, uh, drug users who carried needles, and eventually heterosexual couples. Eventually, the government did begin to run um, and put money into medicine. It was a slow response, um, and he got some criticism for how slow the government responded. However, um, he is well regarded for helping to negotiate an end to the Cold War, entering into armament agreements with the Soviet Union, encouraging them to expand their economics, uh, taking a bit of a tough stance on the Soviet Union. He was also very, very good at public speaking, um, quick on his feet, elegant, funny, um, someone people genuinely liked hearing speak. Um, there was an assassination attempt on Reagan in 1981 where he was pretty badly injured. And when his wife got to the hospital, he said, honey, I forgot to duck. Um, so he had that kind of humor, right? You're just like, wow, how did you even think about that? But 
he was pretty well liked for his um, ability to speak. He was a very, very good communicator, um, very good at using his words. Okay, so Reagan serves two terms in office and then he's replaced by his vice president, George Herbert Walker Bush. Bush made a fundamental mistake that no candidate should ever, ever make. You do not promise absolutes. He said in his campaign, read my lips, no new taxes. Then there was a recession. What do you have to do? Raise taxes. You don't ever promise absolutes to American people, especially if you know you may have to go back on them. Not very smart on his part. Um, he did sign the Americans with Disabilities Act in 1990, which has led to better access on public transportation, wheelchair ramps, um, elevators, handicap parking, very, very important um, protections. And he also approved reparations for Japanese Americans who had been held in internment camps. Um, Congress issued a formal apology and the survivors were given compensation for their homes, jobs, etc. Um, so big, big step forward. And also, was the president when the U.S. got involved in the first Gulf War. This was when Saddam Hussein had invaded Kuwait, and the U.S. and NATO um, went in to kick Saddam Hussein out of Kuwait. It was a very successful, quick war with not a lot of casualties. Um, so his actions there were seen as very positive. Uh, he kicked Saddam Hussein out of Kuwait and um, he was asked if he wanted to try to continue the war and kick Saddam Hussein out of power and he said, no, we're not doing that. We've done our mission, we're out of here. He also opened the negotiations for the North American Free Trade Agreement or NAFTA as it's known. But when he was up for re-election, he was kind of seen as out of touch by the American people. In one of the debates, while people were speaking, you seen looking at what he did. Um, it doesn't send a good signal. Um, he also didn't seem to know how much basics like a gallon of milk cost, um, because he hadn't been responsible for grocery shopping in over a decade, right? He'd been the vice president, and the president, they don't do their own shopping. So he had no idea what basic goods and service cost. Um, so that didn't really help during his re-election campaign. It also didn't help that he talked about uh, manufacturing jobs in the United States, and then they found out that his signs, banners, etc., were being made in uh, China and other countries. That didn't look very good either. It didn't help that he had Ross Perot running against him, and that captured the Republican vote between the two men. Okay, so then we get Bill Clinton, right? Um, he comes into office and he signs the Family and Medical Leave Act into place. It basically allows someone, if they become very, very ill and they need to take long term leave from their job, they're guaranteed to get some kind of compensation for that. Um, also, a little bit of maternity leave, although, quite frankly, we are terrible compared to other countries. Most of are lucky to get maybe up to six weeks of maternity in most countries it's six months to a year. So we're a bit behind on that. Um, he did try to create a new health care plan, but he couldn't get anywhere. He did sign into law the Brady Bill. The Brady Bill was named for James Brady, who was Reagan's press secretary. Brady was so badly injured in his duty, permanently paralyzed, and actually died a couple of years ago from his injuries. The Brady Bill was named for him to create federal background checks on gun purchases. Make it a little harder for someone to get a gun if they have a conviction. Um, make sure that they're not um, getting access to a gun when they could. 
She also, of course, signed NAFTA into law. Um, obviously, this has its benefits and drawbacks. On the one hand, it's now easier to get goods from Mexico and Canada. On the other hand, American companies started opening factories in Mexico where they don't have to pay minimum wage and all the manufacturing jobs went south. Um, I don't think, to be fair, I don't think they saw that as a result. They, I don't think they realized that was what was going to happen if jobs would, would move abroad. Um, for better or worse, NAFTA did exist. Um, and of course, Clinton is remembered quite a bit for the Monica Lewinsky scandal. Um, when he was governor of Arkansas, he had a tendency to have extramarital affairs, and people knew about it prior to running for president, but they're just kind of like, yeah, whatever. Um, but then he gets into office and he has an affair with an intern. And then he lies to Congress about it, which was fundamentally stupid. You do not lie to Congress. He should have just said, yes, I had a relationship with this woman, I'm sorry, I hurt my family, but now it's a private matter. It is not illegal to have an affair. It's illegal to lie to Congress about it. Of course, he wasn't the first president to have multiple affairs in offices. Kennedy was notorious for going through the series in the White House. Um, for some reason, presidents, I don't know what it is, but they seem to, yeah. Um, you don't lie to Congress. You don't lie to Congress about it. Um, so he got impeached by the House, but the Senate did not convict him. Overall, though, he was a pretty well liked president. He did balance the budget, um, got the U.S. out of a long running recession, left office with um, a surplus in the budget. So he actually left office with a higher approval rating than when he started. Most people were willing to forgive the fact that he'd had an affair because he really did get the economy turned around. Um, did improve health care and things like that. So overall, he's still a pretty popular former president. Um, can keep it in his pants, but really good at balancing the budget. Now we get to George W. Bush. The 2000 election was one of the most controversial, difficult, and frustrating elections in modern history. I showed you guys that infamous Florida butterfly ballot that looked like Trump Otter designed it. Um, they couldn't call Florida because there's all these questions about who did they intend to vote for, as a partial punch count, how do we do this? Now, in an ideal situation, what they would have done is they would have said, Florida, you need to redo the vote with ballots that actually work. Instead, what happened was the count went to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court halted the recount and declared Bush the winner. But we may never know who actually won in Florida. So there was a lot of unpopularity about that. They wouldn't let him walk to his inauguration site. Um, because people were protesting growing eggs and things like that. They were pretty good law. Obviously, um, his handling of 9-11 is considered incredibly good. Um, shutting down the domestic flights, um, going to ground zero and talking to the first responders, being very calm when talking to the American people, and very importantly, saying to the American people, do not say that Muslims did this because most Muslims are peaceful, they are not responsible for this, do not go after your neighbors. The hate crimes against Muslims skyrocketed right after 9-11. Um, tons of people were murdered uh, and the president said, look, don't blame them, they're not responsible. Um, and his handling of the war in Afghanistan was very popular at first. Um, it didn't take too long to get the Taliban out of Af 
Afghanistan, at least temporarily, and reroute al-Qaeda um, to Pakistan for the most part. But he was criticized for no child left behind, which were seen as teachers teaching to the test and not very popular amongst educators. During the war in Iraq, at the same time as Afghanistan, a lot of people saying we got to finish the job in Afghanistan first. We haven't even found Bin Laden. Why are we going to war in Iraq? Um, and then the federal government botching the response to Hurricane Katrina. Um, the images of New Orleans citizens stuck in the Superdome after the storm, the FEMA trailers, the lack of um, rebuilding outside of the areas of New Orleans. This wasn't very um, well handled. And this, you guys will get a laugh out of this. Um, Kanye West was on a special for New Orleans relief, and he said George W. Bush doesn't care about black people. So he's obviously changed a bit since then. Um, Bush also did tax, I'm sorry, did cut taxes. The cost of these tax cuts and the wars did lead to a bit of a recession. It only got worse when the housing market collapsed in 2008. Um, some of the restrictions on the lenders at the banks have been removed. They were giving people mortgages for more than they could afford. Eventually, of course, they couldn't afford the payments anymore and the housing market completely collapsed. Now, he did support a path to citizenship for illegal immigrants. He started the Dreamer program. Um, wanted to increase the number of um, temporary work visas for migrants, things like that. It's got a bit of a mixed legacy. On the one hand, he is very highly praised for his handling of 9-11. Um, on the other hand, he left office and the country was in the worst recession since um, the Great Depression. So he very, very wisely put his head down and stayed out of the limelight for most of Obama's first term. Um, he knew he wasn't popular, he knew the American people didn't love him, so he stepped back. Um, now his image has been a bit more rehabilitated. He has a very good friendship with the Clintons and the Obamas. Um, he's seen as someone who is willing to work with both sides, so he kind of come back around a little bit. Um, and he's also been very, very vocal in his opposition to President Trump, which is unusual because you really don't see um, former presidents of the same party criticizing members of their own party, um, but he has. Okay, then we get Obama. Um, and Obama is the first African American president. This was groundbreaking in so many ways. Um, Huge celebrations across the U.S. Global headlines are talking about how good it was, and people mistakenly believing, well, no racism isn't a thing in the United States because we've elected a black man. And, no. Um, what he did was bailed out the banks, Wall Street, and the auto industries to revamp the economy, increased the Amount of time for unemployment benefits for most Americans led to the creation of the Affordable Care Act. And yeah, the Affordable Care Act isn't perfect. Millions of Americans who now have health insurance wouldn't have had it otherwise. Um, so it actually was a somewhat important change to the health care system. By the end of his first term, the economy really was turning around, um, it was getting better. He was also president when we were finally able to capture and kill Osama bin Laden in May of 2011. Um, he came out in support of same-sex marriage. He overturned the policy of don't ask, don't tell, which basically said you can serve in the military as long as you're not openly gay. He overturned that and said you can serve in the military if you're openly gay, we just have to do it. Um, Originally, he hadn't come out in favor of same-sex marriage, but he did 
Um, and when Obergefell and same-sex marriage became legal, the White House was lit up in rainbow colors to show their support of the Supreme Court. Um, he also wanted to deal with gun control. He was president during some of the worst shootings in history, Sandy Hook, um, the Post Nightclub, and others. And when you have a guy walking into an elementary school and killing children, you know there's a problem, right? So he tried really hard to get things done on gun control. He got some measures put into place, but not as much as he would have liked. Because of his handling of the economy, uh, his steady leadership, a good relationship with most countries, he would have a pretty high approval rating when he left office. Um, he's still considered a pretty highly regarded president. Historians tend to rate him as a pretty good president. Um, not the best, obviously, but definitely pretty good. Um, what he did really did um, change things for the better for a lot of people. Got us out of the recession, got people access to health care, increased rights for same-sex couples, he signed the hate crimes into the law. Uh, so he's considered a pretty effective, um, pretty efficient president. Um, not without controversy, of course, but considered a pretty good president overall. We're not going to talk about Trump because, well, we don't know who won the election yet, so he may get another term. Um, we'll end with Obama. Uh, any questions on this? Right, so historically, some of the best presidents that historians consistently rank are Washington, Jefferson, Lincoln, um, Franklin Roosevelt tend to be in the top 10 of every historian's list. Um, presidents tend to include people like um, Buchanan and others. Uh, so if you ever look at a list, um, you can see usually consistently certain presidents at the top, certain presidents at the bottom, and then they just kind of mix what they put in depending on the historian. Buchanan, he was responsible for the Civil War. Um, he didn't do anything about the issues with um, slavery. He basically dropped the ball on it. He didn't want to tackle it, and so his lack of action led to um, the Civil War. Also, Hoover, because he didn't do a damn thing about the Great Depression. Honestly, those are two of the worst in my opinion. Yeah. Um, Hoover didn't do anything until it was too late, and he could have tried to do something, but he didn't. So, those are two of the worst in my opinion. My favorite is actually um, FDR. I think he did a lot of really important things for the country. Um, Obviously, the internment of Japanese Americans, to go back in time, I'd smack him around for that. But uh, the expansion of the federal government, getting us out of the Great Depression, his leadership in World War II, um, the fact that he had the first woman in a cabinet position, he was a pretty good president. He was really, really, he was what we needed at the time. He, he's one of my favorites. But everyone has their own. Okay, um, next week we're going to talk about the Supreme Court on Tuesday, also federal courts. Read chapter 15 for Tuesday. Remember that your papers are due by 11.59 p.m. on Tuesday. Um, if for some reason Blackboard is not working, you can let me know um, and I'll extend the deadline if that happens. But try to get your papers by midnight on Tuesday. Are there any questions on the paper? Yes. Five papers plus references and double space. Double space. Right. Any other questions? Everyone's good? Okay. Um, stay safe. Be careful out there. Things may get crazy if we find out who won sooner or later. So just be careful out there. Stay safe. And I'll see you guys online on Tuesday.